Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. His mum actually has put me in hospital for 24 hours where she bit me when I was feeding her and damaged uh, a tendon. And if I, if I release any pressure off him, he will know that, he'll feel it, and he will then react to that. Extremely strong, extremely strong. You can stress him out um, too much, yeah. But when he's that little, he's okay they're not going to attack you just because you're there but if you land on and get too close it's like anything here in their space they're going to let you know but look at that it's beautiful isn't it okay yeah okay i might put him back so he doesn't stress out too much australia has a reputation as having some of the most dangerous animals in the world Gane Doyle has been bitten by almost all of them. I'm not pulling out the other all of that because then we'd have a lot more blood shots. <laughs> At over 12 feet long, the olive python is Australia's second largest snake. And although it's not venomous, it regularly preys on rock wallabies and even small crocodiles, ambushing them from under the water. These um, have got, of course, large teeth. There's, a, there's over 100 teeth in the mouth of one, on one of these. Um, very, very strong, extremely strong snake that can make you feel uncomfortable. This one here has wrapped around my neck once and um, made me feel quite uncomfortable. Now, one of the things that we do here is so that the snake knows it's going to be picked up and not being fed is we use our hat. That's why we always wear hats. He now knows, because they are intelligent, he now knows he's not getting fed. The danger is not from the snake's razor-sharp teeth. It's the sheer strength. If that wraps around your neck, it can cause you to black out without any problems. I can feel the, um, the strength around my throat at the moment. Uh, he wants to go back to his warmth. A extremely strong snake. This particular snake, I had him out at the other end of the shed, just doing a display, and he reached up using me as a perch, and I could feel myself blacking out, because he put so much pressure on my neck, it was slowing the blood circulation off to me, to my brain, and I started to feel a bit, a bit woozy. Here you go. I'm trying to shut the door back in. Sure. Gain and his father run the family business, the WA Reptile Park, in Perth, Western Australia. He's grown up living alongside Australia's apex predators. 
venomous snakes, crocodiles, and dingoes. Not all the animals here are deadly, but the majority can do some serious damage. There are some you could keep as pets at your own risk. There are some pythons that have a few attitude problems and want to bite or wrap around. You just got to be aware of all that. But, you know, as a pet, they're pretty easy to keep. Yeah, um, I mean, Lacey there, he's really easy to keep and he's quite friendly, but there's always that chance that something can go, something can go wrong. I like him. Yeah. What have we got here, Dan? This is a lace mono from the Eastern States. A lot of people in the Eastern States have these as pets. And um, this one here has bitten me. Got very sharp teeth, but that was only because I was feeding it. And it missed the um, it missed the the rats that I was feeding it that day, and grabbed all five fingers on one hand. Your claws and the teeth are extremely sharp. Um, when this fella bit me, and again it was only by accident, uh, he did do a bit of slice and dice in my fingers, but there was no. He didn't cause me any problems to go to hospital or anything like that. Yeah, I may have needed stitches, but I stayed home. I don't like going to hospital too often. <laughs> oh, this one's pretty cool. When you actually feed this fella, we um, give him a scratch on the back. He arcs up the back like he, like he enjoys it. Emotion, no. Personality, yes. This fella has his own little personality. And uh, yeah, look at that. He's beautiful, isn't he? Closely related to the Komodo dragon, Lacey may be a friendly monitor, but the tools he uses to prey on small mammals and birds in the wild leave their mark on his handlers too. He's just using it and he's just hanging on so the points go through. I mean, our skin's soft compared to them. So that's, yeah, you get that all the time. I, I never worry about any little scratches or anything like that. It's part of the job, you know, getting bitten or scratched or whatever, you know. It happens. It's not the nicest of feelings, um, you know, being bitten. Yeah, but yeah, with this type of job, it can happen if you make, you, know, you don't pay attention to what you're doing. A small scratch or even a large bite from a monitor lizard or a crocodile may not bother Gain too much, but surely a tag from one of the world's deadliest snakes would slow him down. Australia have 17 to the top 20 and this is one of them. And this is one of our, our local uh, snakes for Western Australia, which is a dugai, which is a brown, but it's our, our local one around the Perth area. This one here got me in 2016. Uh, he wasn't in this cage, he was in another cage, and I was cleaning him out. And I had the words go through my head, turn on the light, and I didn't turn the light on. I hooked him and he grabbed me. So I don't know which end I was trying to lift and he actually bit two fingers. And, and envenomated me. It was about 25 minutes before I felt any effects, and then spent 30 odd hours in hospital, getting one lot of antivenine, and um, my kidney stopped working. So I, I guess now that we've got a special relationship, me and him, he's had a piece of me, and I've had a piece of him. <laughs> it's just, yeah, just uh, extremely nice, nice snake. Not only does Gain still consider the snake that could have killed him to be an extremely nice snake, he takes full responsibility for the incident. He knows only too well how serious the consequences can be if you make a mistake with a deadly predator. If you get too, you know, a bit blasé or anything like that, and you take your brain off out of, out of gear, you can pay them and make a mistake. And um, every now and then you do that. And, some can be fatal or you can end up being crook. I mean, I've made two mistakes with two venomous snakes in 40 odd years. And um, yeah, it's knocked us around and all the rest of it. But my fault, not, not, the, um, not the snake's fault because I was choosing to do something that I shouldn't have done. While it's certainly unconventional, Gain forms rewarding bonds with animals that many would never consider having as pets. Well, I used to have my first tiger snake. You know, when when he passed away, I was I was quite upset because I used to go to um, do displays and talk to these kids and say, instead of on theory, I now had practical experience of what a snake bite felt like. 
this was the one that did it. And um, yeah, when he passed away, I was quite upset because we had that special relationship, that bond of, um, that was my first bite. Again, it was my fault, but you know, it was still okay. I've now, one of the people had been bitten by a venomous snake and survived. <laughs> This one's bit me as well. This one has bit me as well. But he's still a nice snake. He's still a nice snake, yeah. And in a very Captain Hook moment, we meet the mother of the crocodile we saw earlier, the one that sent Gain to the hospital and could have easily taken his hand. She bit me when I was doing a feeding display um, in here with 45 kids. And it was the first chicken of the day, and I'd normally feed her in. 12 o'clock, but I decided to do it later. And when I put my hand out over with the, with the tongs, because we use tongs for these little fellas, had a chicken on the end of the tong, it saw the hand and just grabbed hold of the hand. I went through all the scenarios of what should I do to get it off? And I thought if I pulled my arm up and put it on the balcony, that see if she would release, but then I realized with those teeth that they, they slice, she would have done more damage, so I just, hung there and just waited. Our eyes met, so we had a moment for a little bit, and then eventually um, she let go and slipped straight back into the water. I swapped hands and continued on feeding them. It severed 80% of one of my tendons and went through the knuckle. So it wasn't too bad. If it had rolled or twisted, it could, you know, could have severed the tendons or severed a few more, but I was all okay. I didn't lose any fingers or any movement. Yeah, just out of action. But does this croc remember his human prey like the crocodile nemesis remembered Captain Hook in Peter Pan? I think she does. I mean, she's had a taste of me, this one. She knows what I taste like, so yeah, she likes me. Young girl. This is my girl. Gaines' experience working with crocs means, despite their previous encounter, he's not concerned about getting too close this time. She stays there, um, but I'm not moving any further to her. Um, she's already let me know that she doesn't want me any closer by a bit of a, a breathing and huffing at me. I feel quite safe here. She's not going to move any further um, from where she is. And again, it's, it's the colder weather, and if she was warm, she'd be straight into the pond if I was getting too close. They're not going to try and attack. I've been closer to one and actually fed one closer. Um, and it did get me when it jumped up to, um, with, when feeding. It jumped up, missed it, and just caught me on the uh, hand. And I was right next to it feeding it. That, yep, that's the, the boy and the girl. They're the dingoes. Go and see them. Australia's wild dogs Dingoes are sometimes kept as pets, but most owners will tell you that they can never be completely domesticated. This is Blondie, and she's a good girl. When we first got Blondie, she broke out of her, her, her pen. She found a very small hole, about six foot off the ground, and climbed out. But she's so blonde, she showed me where the hole was so I could fix it. In your girl. Hey? Eh? Hey? Eh? How about we go and see Max? Hey, is there a ladder coming, Max? Come on. Hey. He was brought to us, um, to the park, because the people, their situation changed. We normally don't take them on if they're uh, over 18 months old, because they, um, their personalities are really set. But Max was really good. He bonded to us very easily. So I decided to take him on. I don't 100% trust him, but yeah, I can pick when he's not right. Come on. The only thing with dingoes, you can't train them. They don't come when you call, but they're highly intelligent. The dingoes are as close to pets as any of the animals here at the WA Reptile Park, but Gain remains alert when around them. They still have that killer instinct. They'll still knock off other animals. Yeah, people do have them as pets, but they just got to be aware that they're totally different. If you really bring them up right, 
they can, they are extremely nice pets, but you just gotta you gotta treat them nicely because they don't ever forget. Having been strangled by a python and bitten by crocodiles, lizards, and deadly venomous snakes, there's still one animal here that game won't get close to. I never trust a wombat. Never turn your back on a wombat. They are dangerous. It's automatic. Get out. Especially the males, breeding season, they change and they they will attack. And and they jump up and it's pretty dangerous for a bloke because they can jump up about a metre high and if you're facing a wombat and it jumps up a metre high and grabs what you don't want it to grab, it's going to hurt. It has happened in the eastern states. The bloke had a lot of microsurgery, but yeah, um, no. I'll go and play with a croc any day. You know, some people don't want to live next to a 400-pound pot belly pig. Uh, so, in, in fairness, when you, when you do live in a kind of a built-up city, you know, choose the right pet. Riverside County Animal Services are an animal shelter organization and vet clinic servicing one of the largest counties in California. We cover everything from the city of Riverside, which is a large metropolitan area all the way out to areas out in the Coachella Valley which are just undeveloped open areas of natural desert. So we get a little bit of everything. Each year they respond to thousands of calls from the public, picking up stray dogs, cats, and the occasional more unusual lost pet. Riverside County Animal Services, uh, we are uh, a sheltering service uh, to all the stray animals that come in. And of course, we, we handle a lot of field service work, and that's our officers out in the field uh, retrieving mostly stray dogs and stray cats and the occasional stray crazy thing, you know, whether it be uh, the occasional monkey, alligator, a Burmese python, or somebody keeping a, a deer as a pet. We got a call one afternoon that a woman, her two dogs, had cornered an alligator in her backyard. My dispatcher gets on the radio, dispatches it to me, and I kind of made a smart aleck remark of, sure, I'll go pick up the iguana, thinking that they just saw an iguana and thought it was an alligator. I rolled up to the house, got out of my truck, see two dogs barking at something in the corner, walk over, tell the woman to grab her dogs, and sure enough, there's an alligator in her backyard. It's interesting because we get a lot of different snakes that come from like where they come into people's yards, but we have interesting calls too, where someone will call for a snake like this. I had a snake just like this uh, Southern Pacific that a person called us that they found this snake in their yard and they were in the middle of the city of Riverside and they conveniently had it contained in a terrarium. <laughs> and so when I GPSed the address to try to re-release the snake, I was just thinking to myself, there was no way that this snake ended up in the middle of downtown Riverside, surrounded by blocks and blocks and blocks of residential housing. So they obviously went on a trip to the mountains, who knows what, took the snake out of the wild again and then probably the wife or something was like, hey, the heck no, you're not keeping that snake. And so they called, you know, animal control and said, oh, I found it in my yard, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but stuff like that happens fairly frequently. You know, well, most of the time it's a legitimate call where you can see, you know, their house is butted up against, you know, natural landscape and, and it's like, yeah, if you're going to build your home on their habitat, they're going to come into your yard, but occasionally we get these strange calls. I have personally got one call uh, where someone had a rattlesnake that they had caught um, and taken it home, stuck it in a china cabinet put duct tape across the door of the china cabinet and stuck a brick in front of it and had it in there for a week. And then they re quickly realized that they couldn't safely open the door to feed it and didn't know how to care for it. So they ended up calling for help and I ended up having to go in and uh, remove the rattlesnake out of, out of a uh, china cabinet. So that was a pretty poor, poorly thought out plan. And it's often poor planning and lack of knowledge that puts exotic pet owners and their neighbors in danger. The animal, when it ends up doing something really bad, the person always says, but he was always so calm and, and, and never showed any signs of aggression. But 
um, it just takes one time, right, for that person to suffer serious injuries and in some cases death. So it really, the onus is really on that person that owns the exotic legally, if they have it permitted, um, to protect their, their fellow neighbors. In 2009, a 330-pound pet tiger escaped from her enclosure and was discovered in the backyard of a very surprised 79-year-old woman in Ingram, Texas. A 275-pound pet cougar escaped from his cage in a Florida backyard menagerie and killed a neighbor's dog in 2012. And in 2017, a classroom of third graders were surprised to find a four-foot-long boa constrictor inside their classroom. Officers believe the snake may have been an escaped pet from a nearby house. Well, you know, when people are having um, a pet that's a dangerous, you know, they know how to handle it, but the neighbor doesn't, or the little kid next door um, has no clue on, you know, uh, that you have a dangerous exotic pet. That, um, that's where you, you as the pet owner need to make sure, just like, you know, in the dog world, if you have a large dog, uh, you want to be responsible, make sure it doesn't get out. And same thing, if you have a dangerous exotic animal, and it doesn't mean it has to be a big animal, a monkey, for example, can bite people, which we ha had happen in, in one of our cities that uh, we had to respond to. Um, uh, a monkey bit a, a, a person at a pizza place because the person thought it would be fun to have a monkey on their shoulder at a pizza place. And and so you you got to draw the line sometimes with having a cool pet that's cool for you to have, but making sure your, your community members are, are protected and safe. And that would be our message to those folks is make sure that exotic is not going to harm anyone. One of the most common exotic animal escape artists is the snake, and the Riverside team are often called to retrieve venomous reptiles from suburban areas. So both of these guys are from the local area that were brought in by our animal control officers, and I keep them purely for the purpose of using them for training, for rattlesnake safety and handling. So this one is, is a western diamondback rattlesnake, and how we came across this one was that um, there was a woman in Palm Desert who uh, who had to be put into a care facility and when they went in to get her out of the house um, she had this snake in an aquarium in her house and it was a little 10 gallon aquarium the snake was a really tiny little baby probably just born that year and so it was a little 10 gallon aquarium with a, um, a, an aqu a fish toy in it, like the, you would see in a fish aquarium, like a sunken ship toy. So she was trying to keep it as a pet. And, and so because we don't know the exact location of where it came from, you can't just take it and relocate it and throw it back outside. So for us, the only, um, the only options are either, you know, you find a home for it with a research facility or um, maybe an educational institution. Otherwise, it has to be euthanized unless we know of the natural area where it came from and we could relocate it within its home range. While Kim provides Riverside officers with venomous snake handling training, there's no way they can train for every possible animal encounter. Uh, Burmese python is a common home pet, or at least in the state of California it is. Another county officer, she got a call in the middle of the night that a 30-foot snake was going through these person's front yard. Uh, she shows up on scene, calls me in the middle of the night, wakes me up, and says, hey, Dylan, I need some assistance. I have a 30-foot snake. So I thought she was just joking with me at first, and sometimes we joke with each other and give each other prank calls and stuff like that. Uh, but I made it down there, and sure enough, there was a large snake under these people's, uh, I believe it was a eucalyptus bush that was going alongside the, uh, the fence line. All I did was grab it with a, a catch pole, got that around its head. The, the snake obviously coiled up around the pole, and then we just carried it to the truck like a, like a rotisserie rack. One person on one side, one person on the other side, and we put it in the truck like that, we let go of the loop, and it hung out in the truck for the way back. 
you know, a lot of the the training for some of these exotics kind of happens like that moment in time. Uh, you don't really respond to a domesticated deer call every day. When it comes to like a Burmese python, it's, you know, the officers, they're really good with their control stick, their, or the catch pole as it's known. Some of these are uh, just really kind of bizarre calls that they just have to use their instincts. Bear in mind, the officers are dealing with some of the most vicious dogs that you might see um, walking the street. Some of them are, are bully breed dogs. Some of them are very aggressive. And these officers don't scare easily. In fact, I think the Burmese python scared that one officer more so than, than a, a large pit bull coming at her. Uh, those are just such weird, odd calls and you don't really know how to handle the Burmese python and you don't want to get choked to death. So those, those types of calls are sort of like, you know, you learn as you go sometimes. Every call out comes with a risk and Riverside officers can just never be sure what they'll encounter when they arrive at a scene. At the time of it, it's a little hectic and scary just because you don't know if it's fully domesticated. A lot of people, they have these quote unquote wild animals for pets and never socialize them properly. So sometimes they will bite or do other things that aren't foreseen. Much of what Riverside County Animal Services does also involves educating the public about choosing the right pet and then providing that pet with the appropriate care. Those folks that liked, for example, to have a Burmese python, sometimes they get them when they're young and then they're not really fully educating themselves on, on just how large those snakes can get. And it's not the easiest pet to care for once it's an adult pet. I mean, they get 20 to 30, you know, they get very long and very wide. And when you go out of town and you ask your buddy to, you know, feed your pet, uh, make sure the buddy knows how, how to close the, the tank of the Burmese python securely, because that's when you get into problems where, you know, the next door neighbor finds out that you have a 20 foot Burmese python. Educating the general public on exotics is important because some people um, like to have interesting pets. And then when it comes to animals like a tegu lizard, uh, quite an amazing, uh, critter, but um, they can get big too, and your neighbor may not want to see that tegu lizard knocking on their front door. So, you know, it's really making sure that your that exotic pet is going to stay in your property and not wander off, because that can really scare the heck out of somebody if they are finding out that you own that tegu lizard and they didn't know that. Another one I had uh, a tegu running down Wood Road. Somebody called for a large lizard in the road, so I arrived on scene, and sure enough, there was, uh, the body was probably only about two feet long, but the tails were, tails about three feet long, and their tail is stronger than heck, so they can whip you and cut you open with that. It's kind of like keeping a, you know, some of the more uh, aggressive dog breeds. Uh, you know, it, if you've got a responsible owner that knows what they're doing, you can keep some of those safely. Um, and then there's some things that you just shouldn't have. You know, when we walk into a house and somebody's caught a rattlesnake from out in the desert and it's in an aquarium, it's a venomous snake. Nobody should be keeping those as pets. Um, boa constrictor, you know, there are responsible people out there that can keep them as a pet, but it's not a pet for everybody. Most people probably don't have the skills, the ability, the finances, just the space to keep something that can potentially get as large as those are gonna get. We're in the business of promoting um, responsible pet ownership, whether you own a dog, a cat, or a rabbit, or a horse, um, a tortoise. We always want people to love that animal uh, and make it part of your family. We don't really um, have any strong opinion one way or the other when it comes to exotic pets. We just don't like when somebody uh, no longer is interested in being the pet owner of said exotic pet and then they just re release it into the wild and uh, scaring their neighbors or also uh, shamefully allowing that animal to suffer because uh, it could get hit by a car just like a dog or a cat or it goes off into the wild and gets killed by other critters. But, but it's shameful when the pet loses its charm and then they, they think, oh, I'll just dump it in the riverbed or um, you know, I'll just release it. 
if you have an exotic pet, know how long that pet will be in your life. A tortoise, for example, can live 70, 80, 90, 100 years. So you might want to put the tortoise in your will and know that your son is going to be caring for the next 50 years of that tortoise's life. That's the only thing we, we, we'd like to share with people that are interested in, in exotic pets is know it's a part of your family. And, and when it loses its charm, don't forget, you're still the pet parent. The officers at Riverside County Animal Services have dealt with everything from escaped emus to roaming reptiles. And when it comes to exotic animals, they've seen firsthand that too little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. I think that, at least here in California, for the most part, with stuff that could kill a human being, I think that those who have them that do it legally are able, you know, okay but they have to reach such a bar, it's such a high bar for them to get to those proper permits and stuff. It's a, you know, I'm kind of okay with those people. It's the backyard person who doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't have that training and hasn't gone through all the permitting process and the inspection process to try and keep a lion or a tiger or, you know, you know something else along those lines that it's, it's a recipe for disaster. You can go to any zoo, any private place in the United States or around the world, and as soon as there's a fence, you don't have to treat them like a tiger. They're not predators anymore. They're just beautiful, interesting, and here for our enjoyment. From the fashionable Victorian menagerie to the animal stunts we see in modern movies, exotic animals have long performed for our enjoyment and entertainment. But what happens to the animals when they can no longer perform? Many end up at sanctuaries like the Performing Animal Welfare Society, a 2,300-acre natural habitat wildlife sanctuary located near San Andreas, California. This unique facility is currently home to nine elephants, four lions, one black leopard, seven bears, 22 tigers, and co-founder and president Ed Stewart. This is Kim, and she's in there with Roy and Claire. She's 15 years old, came out of a roadside zoo in New Hampshire, and was scheduled to go to the pet industry. Somebody intercepted her and brought her to us when they were just cubs. Hi. Hi. Hi, <laughs> I know. You're a wonderful girl. Yeah, you're good. Paws provides homes for retired or mistreated animal entertainers and investigates reports of abuse performing in exotic animals. Unsurprisingly, Ed has strong feelings about exotic animal ownership of any kind. I know that there are some good facilities and some are good, some are bad, but the ultimate goal for all of these places is a little murky to me. Is it to return animals to the wild? Is it to teach people about animals? I think all of it is ineffective. In the history of the world, nobody has taken a captive tiger and put it into the wild. And with the shrinking habitat, it's never going to happen. So reintroduction is a pipe dream. It's, it's not going to happen. And while some may argue that captivity is a valid way of preserving a species or educating the public about conservation, others, like Ed, believe that captivity changes an animal to the extent that it is no longer anything like its ancestors. Our mission is to give the animals that we take the best life we can give them, knowing that we can't give them a normal life. We can't give her a natural life. She's 15 years old and she has never had to catch her dinner, never had to hunt for her food. We have provided everything. You put an animal in an enclosure, whether it's a big enclosure or a small enclosure, you have totally changed their life. She's an apex predator. She would hunt almost constantly looking for enough food. She would be raising babies, she would have an incredible responsibility in the wild, and she would rely only on herself. Their natural history is so ingrained in them to perform their duties, and you take all that away in captivity. As soon as you put a fence up, you create disrespect for that animal. It's something of a contradiction for Ed. 
On one hand, he's against keeping wild animals in captivity. On the other, he keeps captive animals. We're honestly looking at these animals every day. We really want to do the best we can for them. But the best thing you can do for them is not promote it in captivity, because they're just not designed to live captive. And it's, it's a black and white issue. So we don't look at her or him like a tiger. We look at him as an individual. They're so far removed from a real tiger in the wild. We know we have to do absolutely the best we can for them and give them the nicest place we can to, to live and, and the best vet care. But if, I, if we had a breeding pair, I would, I would be heart sick if I was the one responsible for creating a litter of baby tigers that would have to live their whole life in a cage. You know, it's just basic freedom for a tiger to be wild. Paul's director of veterinary services, Dr. Jackie Guy, has the job of ensuring that all the animals are kept healthy. Many of the problems she sees are a direct result of captivity. Animals in captivity, especially wild animals in captivity, can develop all sorts of problems that are unique to captivity that aren't found in wild populations. So as a captive wildlife veterinarian, I would say probably 95% of the problems that I'm seeing in my patients are related to captivity in one way or another. An example of that is um, this is a tiger. These are um, radiographs or x-rays of a tiger's spine who is, he's an adult. He's not an old man by any means, but he's a mature adult. And he's got significant, significant arthritis um, that, you know, would not be seen in a wild tiger. This is an early onset of really, really severe arthritis. And the problems Dr. Jackie sees associated with captivity are not just physical health issues. Confinement is very hard on animals, regardless of the size of the cage. Um, being confined brings with it all sorts of um, challenges for especially formerly wild animals or wild animals. Wild animals are not domesticated. In other words, they're not used to being held captive. And so there are instincts that they have that are, um, they're not able to express and that leads to frustration. It leads to a lot of behavioral problems, a lot of anxiety and stress, um, which sometimes they'll end up pacing or tossing their heads or doing various repetitive behaviors. And we've all seen that. We've all seen a pacing bear in a cage or a tiger in a cage. That's abnormal. They don't do that in the wild. Also, a really sad thing is when an exotic animal begins to self-mutilate or damage itself, pull its hair out or pull its feathers out, um, and that's, that's an unfortunate consequence of stress, of being in captivity. Winston, one of the sanctuary's current bear residents, has only recently stopped displaying those telltale signs of captive boredom. Captivity, it's a challenge. When you look at California mountains, that's where they should live. The Smoky Mountains, Florida, they're all over uh, the United States. And when they're in captivity, a lot of times, they're one of the worst pacers, one of the worst at rocking their heads. They, they just don't have anything to do. As former pets or performers, the animals here are accustomed to being around humans and many involved in the exotic animal ownership debate believe that they should continue to enjoy human companionship. Hey, girls. Come on, let go. Come on, girls, let go. Come on, Tika. What a good girl. What a good girl. Mara, let go. Come on, young lady. Yeah. Good girl. Nice. Oh, 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 oh. oh boy. Oh boy. See their teeth are they're made for eating. You can see it in there. They're made for eating branches and hard brush and 
eating a very low protein, high fiber diet. We don't ever teach them tricks just to teach them a trick, but in order to check their teeth, it's good to be able to handle them a little bit. We don't go inside with them, but we do it from the outside. Elephants are actually, can be really, really excellent patients. They're very intelligent. They enjoy interacting with us. And we use positive reinforcement training with our elephants, meaning they choose to participate in their own health care, and they're rewarded for that. They're never punished. And so consequently, it's actually quite easy for me to provide veterinary care for such an intelligent species. They're very easy to work with. They voluntarily will allow me to draw blood, take x-rays, uh, work on their feet. Even more invasive things like collecting a small biopsy, things like that, they have learned um, that you know, we're not here to punish or harm them in any way, so they're actually really good patients. But not all of Dr. Guy's patients are as cooperative as the elephants. It can definitely be dangerous being around dangerous exotic animals, dangerous wild animals in captivity or free ranging for anybody, including um, an owner of an animal, but certainly for the veterinarian. And so again, it, it takes somebody like myself who's had specialized training to know how to safely treat these animals, but there's always a potential for you know, somebody to get hurt. And although Ed feels that captive exotics are no longer the predators they would be in the wild, even he has no doubt they remain potentially deadly. Predators know that they're predators. They don't know why, maybe, that they're focused on vulnerable things, but they do. Somebody with crutches, somebody in a wheelchair, somebody who's lagging behind, they know even though they don't have to it's just part of their nature to stalk and maybe hunt. And while many owners of exotic pets do provide for all their needs, caring for such unusual animals proves too difficult for many, and they often arrive at sanctuaries with a host of health issues. We have right now the second oldest African elephant in the country uh, living here. It's almost like a retirement home in some ways, especially for elephants. You know they're getting old. You know they have arthritis before they get here. Sometimes they have foot problems, toe problems, infections or bone problems. And so you just want to give them as many good years as you can. We, in a sanctuary situation, you rarely see, you know, young, healthy animals in need of placement. They are oftentimes a product of almost what I would call a puppy mill for tigers, where they're just breeding and breeding and breeding, sometimes for photo shoots and things like that, with no regard for what happens to them after that function is complete, when the tiger is too big to handle or too big to use in uh, public contact or films, a lot of times they're viewed as disposable, and most of them are unhealthy. They'll come to us with all sorts of issues, uh, vision problems, um, crooked legs, arthritis, um, early kidney disease is very common, um, and some of those conditions are um, genetic. They're congenital um, problems that are passed on from generation to generation. For many animal advocates, freedom is the ultimate goal. But once an animal is already in captivity, options are limited. We do what we can, but we can't give them what, what they should have, and that's their total freedom. Nothing would make us happier than to release these guys to where they should be. But the fact is, they would not be able to do it. They wouldn't have a herd. They wouldn't know what to do. And they'd probably die within a few weeks or less. Okay, we gotta go. We gotta go, you can't eat this whole bucket. Our happiest times are when we see them up on the hill like this, grazing on fresh green grass. When you have a sanctuary, you live for moments where the animals are doing something that they would be doing in the wild. So if they're in a mud hole, if they're grazing, if they're pushing on a tree, if they're tearing branches off, those are all kind of rewarding times for us. But. It's, it's not a substitute uh, for the wild. 
While Ed may be able to provide the illusion of freedom to the animals in his care, he's very aware that true freedom is something they'll never know. If any of these animals could go free, if all of them could go free, we would load them up tomorrow and take them, take them home, take them back and let them go. And I think it's a responsibility for us to tell people the truth about captivity, at least our point of view. And if we don't win the argument, that's okay. We're not gonna beat anybody over the head, but I think if you take a step back and look at captivity, it's, it hasn't worked. It's bad for individuals. It's not helping species. So it's time to change the model. Go to the woods, go to the creek, turn over some rocks, look at the animals, teach your children respect for nature, just basic respect for nature. I think that's the starting point. And if we can't turn it around, we can't turn it around, but let's not make tigers and bears and elephants live in enclosures for the rest of their life, generation after generation after generation for really no reason.